Today I will solve the latest May June 2024 for paper 6 chemistry. This is the first variant from this session. Let me start with the first question. It's talking about titration. So basically they're mixing uh, potassium hydroxide with hydrochloric acid. They already know the concentration of potassium hydroxide. They want to find the concentration of the acid. So they filled up that flask with a 25 potassium hydroxide. They just wanted us first to name a flask and a volumetric pipette. So I'm just going to write these here. So first, it's a conical flask. And second is a volumetric pipette. Next, they said, explain why an indicator should be added to the potassium hydroxide. So why in titration, you must be adding an indicator. The answer is simple. You can't do titration unless you have an indicator, simply because you need to find when you reach the neutralization point. So I'll tell them, like, you need to find when do you neutralize the alkali and you can tell when does that neutralization has happened. Now they wanted me to name a suitable indicator. Obviously you're not going to mention universal indicator. The best to be used in this case is methyl orange or thymothalin. Uh, methyl orange changes its color uh, sharply at the neutralization point. So you can see here it is uh, yellow, that's alkaline with the potassium hydroxide, as you add the acid to it and you reach the neutralization point, you will get to the orange color. You may ask me like, why can't we use phenolphthalein? Simply because for phenolphthalein, the neutralization or the changing color happens around pH 8. And that's not going to be suitable here because we need that change of color to take place at seven. That's where we get to that neutralization. So that's why I'm going to mention methyl orange or thymophthalin. Describe how the student can determine the volume of the acid that's been used in this titration. Here's my burette. Let's assume that we started at zero. So we record the initial reading and then we record the final reading and we simply subtract. So, for instance, if it was 72 and the initial was 0, so 72 minus 0 is 72. So, just tell them, read the initial and final and minus the final from the initial. Question continues here. It says, while you're titrating, what you should be doing. So, while you pour in the acid to the alkali and indicator, what should you be doing? Simply you should be swirling. Why swirling is essential in this case? Because you must ensure that the acid is mixing fully with the alkali. So I'll just tell them here, while titration, while titrating, you should be swirling the flask. This means we're done fully with the first question. Let's get to the second question. The second question, it's taken from the topic of energetics. So basically, they're taking some magnesium ribbon, like the one I have here, and they're adding it to hydrochloric acid, and they're measuring the temperature changes. So you have a boiling tube like this one here, you have an acid, and, and you add the measured centimeters of the magnesium ribbon, and we're checking the temperature change. This is an exothermic reaction. So you would expect the temperature to rise as you add the magnesium to the acid. They've done this experiment five times. What's the difference between these experiments? Simply they're adding water each time. Initially, it was just 20 acid. Then they took 20 acid and they added water. They've increased the water to four, six and 10. What they want me to do now is that they wanted me to record these results in a table. So I'll just get to the next page and write these results. So simply I'll write here the volume of the acid, which did not change. 
here is the volume of water in each experiment, and now we record the temperature reading. So I have the initial temperature being done for me, and that's the final temperature. So here it is 37, here it is 34, and here it's 31.5, and that's at 30, and that is 27.5. What am I supposed to do next? I need to minus the final minus the initial. So I can find the temperature change. So 37 minus 25 is 12. 34 minus 25.5 is 8.5. 31.5 minus 25.5 is 6. 30 minus 26 is 4. And 27.5 minus 26 is 1.5. Which ex Experiment had the smallest temperature change. Very straightforward. You tell them it's the last one because that's the least temperature change that we had. They're trying to prepare us for the second part of the question. Explain why the temperature change was the smallest in this experiment. Look at it. Here we have the largest volume. If you measure the volume here, it's 30 compared to 26 compared to 24. When you're trying to heat up more volume of water, that would lead to less temperature rise. So think about it. If you have two cups and you're trying to boil, the cup with less volume of water is the one that would boil first. Here's the same idea. If you're heating up these liquids, the one with the largest volume is the one that will have the least temperature increase. Next, they wanted us to plot these results. So I have the results here in front of me. I just need to plot the volume of water. So it's going to be 0, 2, 4, 6, 10. Already been done for me. Against the temperature increase. So the least number I have here is 1.5. And the largest I have is 12. Just do it like 2, 4, 6, 8. 10 and 12, and I will plot these results accordingly. So 0 and 12 start here, 2 and 8.5. I'm just going to do it right here. And probably it's pretty simple for you. So I'm just going to show you the outcome here. And then we draw a line of best fit. So they wanted me to draw a straight line of best fit. So it's going to look something like this. Usually the best way to draw a line of best fit is to draw the area with your pencil and split that area into two parts. So I'm just going to look something like where I have here. So that is the line of best fit for these results. For the second part, they wanted me to use my graph to plot 7.5. So that is 0.5 from the x-axis. And I will read how much temperature rise you will have in this case. So I'm just going to draw a line, straight line like this. And that tells you that it's going to be 2 degrees Celsius. Next, they wanted me to do one simple calculation. So you need the temperature increase for experiment 1. I'm just going to take it from the initial table. That's at 12. The temperature increases 12 divided by 45, you get average temperature increase. They wanted me to include the unit. So it's a unit of temperature over a unit of time. So it's going to be Celsius per second. Explain why the result of the experiment would be more accurate if you took the boiling tube and you wrapped it with cotton. You probably know that cotton is a good insulator. If I take the boiling tube and I wrap it around with cotton wool, that cotton wool will reduce the heat loss and you will get a more accurate temperature reading. No more time. Tell them like you include cotton, it would act as an insulator. You would reduce the heat loss and you get a more accurate temperature reading. Next, they said, explain why can't you use a volumetric pipette for measurement of 20 centimeter cubed. This is the volumetric pipette. Volumetric pipette has one drawback. It's very accurate, it's very quick, but it only measures fixed volume. So I can't be using the volumetric pipette to measure 20, not even 24. 
it has to be measure only 25. So I'm going to tell them that here. You can't be using volumetric pipette unless you're trying to measure 25 cm cubed. Um, what could be using then? If I want accuracy, I don't want to use the measuring cylinder and I cannot be using the volumetric pipette. The only option I have is to use the third measurement tool of volume, which is a burette. The burette provides me with accuracy and unlike the volumetric pipette, you can measure whatever volume you would prefer. Next, they said if you decided to use two CMs, magnesium ribbon, instead of five, how would your graph look like? So again, I'm reducing the mass of the magnesium, so I'm expecting less temperature increase. So I'll come back to my line of best fit, and I'm going to draw another line here. I'm just going to draw it to show that I'm expecting less temperature increase. The initial was five, so that's five here, five cm's of magnesium. So I'm expecting less, quite half or less than half of that temperature increase. So if it was 12, I would go by five or 5.5. It doesn't matter. Just show them that you would expect less temperature increase and label that as G because that's what they asked me to label it. So say label line as G. We're now going to the third question. This is the usual one about the identification of ions. You have test tube solution called E and another one is called F. Let's start with E. E is chromium bromide. You will be receiving the data sheet, which includes all the results of these tests. So I'm concerned here about chromium gives me green precipitate, which is soluble in excess. So I'm just going to tell them here, if you took chromium and you add sodium hydroxide to it, you would expect a green precipitate, but that green precipitate actually dissolves if you add excess of sodium hydroxide. Okay, tell them green precipitate dissolves in excess. Next, second portion, we added nitric acid and silver nitrate. You also have in the data sheet the tests of the anion, so bromide and silver nitrate, you would get cream, just like off-white facilitate. So I'm just going to show you here, that's how the test looks like. You get the silver nitrate, you add it to the bromide. See the one on the left, it's chloride. That is bromide, which is cream precipitate. So I'm just going to write this here, to tell them, say green, cream, not green precipitate. Next, I'll get to solid F, which we're meant to identify. So you can see here, there was a condensation. When you heat a solid and you notice there is condensation, that's like water vapor, this tells you one thing. It tells you that this salt is hydrated. So you got water in it. Then they did a litmus tape paper test and it did not change its color. Then they added barium and they got a white precipitate. Now, the only time we use barium is when we're testing for sulfate. So that tells you that solid F must contain sulfate, but we're yet to identify the cation. So none of these tests tells me anything about the cation, not even the last one. So let's just tell them first that if it's hydrated, then the best way to test for a hydrated salt is by using cobalt chloride papers. Cobalt chloride papers turn the color from blue to pink once you add water vapor. So I'm going to tell them here, anhydrous cobalt chloride turns from blue to pink. You can either use cobalt-2 chloride or copper-2 sulfate, but either way, you must write anhydrous. With anhydrous copper sulfate, it's going to change its color from white to blue. Next, we can identify F. Remember, we identified the anion, but we couldn't identify the cation. Is there a way we can identify cations? Yes, there is one way you can identify them by means of a flame test. We couldn't identify it by means of sodium hydroxide pH test, but flame tests could possibly help us 
to identify. We're not meant to write what it is. We're just meant to write the method that we could identify some unknown cation. Finally, identify the anion. We've already done that with a barrier. We identified it was sulfate. We're now getting to the last question, and uh, the six marks question, the one where we're planning an investigation. I got liquid ethanol, I got sodium chloride, and zinc carbonate. They're all mixed together. So imagine you got some liquid, that's ethanol, and right here, just put it to the other side, so you got ethanol here, and here you got a solid. This solid that I have here is sodium chloride and zinc carbonate. I am meant to separate all these from one another. Now, obviously, the easiest way to separate the ethanol from the solids, because none of them is soluble, is simply by means of filtration. So I could just take my mixture, pour that mixture here, so you get the ethanol as you filtrate, and the solids will just be left behind. So here I'll have ethanol as my filtrate, and the residue will be sodium chloride and zinc carbonate. So I'm just going to write this one first, say filter the mixture, and then your ethanol will be the filtrate, and the residue uh, would be the mixture of sodium chloride and zinc um, carbonate. What am I meant to do now to separate the sodium chloride from that zinc carbonate? Here I have a hint. Sodium chloride dissolves in water. So how about we add water, the sodium chloride dissolves, and the zinc carbonate will be left behind, and then we filter again. So I'm just going to take excess water, add it to the uh, residue, and then we filter. So we take that mixture, we add water, we stir. So stirring here is worth one mark. And then the residue will be zinc carbonate, and the filtrate will be the sodium chloride. While uh, filtering the second time here, I need to rinse that residue. Why am I supposed to rinse it uh, continuously? Here's my residue here. I add water here just to make sure that all the sodium chloride gets into the filter. So I'm just going to tell them here, filter, rinse the residue. You get now a filtrate of sodium chloride, just evaporated and dry that zinc carbonate. You can dry it in an oven to get it dry. And the sodium chloride would be, you get rid of the water here from the filtrate, you evaporate the water, leaving behind solid sodium chloride. This means we're done fully with this paper. If you have doubts or questions, just email me your questions and I'm happy to answer you back.